since you promised abundant life, a full life to have it fulfilled is my desire. My desire, fill me with your blessings in every way. Oh, do something special in my life today. I desire to be free. Free. Yes, free. Without within, within me, your word you will perform without delay. Oh, do something special in my life today. I desire to be free, free, yes, free. I welcome all of us, uh, with myself included, to this great Congress in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome all those who are helping us, our singers, our orchestra, our ushers, our security, our youths, children, everybody, fathers and mothers, you are welcome in Jesus' name. It's wonderful to be back again after that wonderful retreat. And I pray that the blessings of the retreat that we have all received will not uh, decrease in Jesus' name. This Congress will be a memorable time in your life. And for those who are joining us because of the Monday Bible study, we are praying that uh, the power and the strength and the anointing coming upon our leaders will come upon you in jesus name we we'll pray that this time will be a refreshing time it's wonderful to have gone through all those days we should have been tired by now i don't see tiredness on your face i see strength i see power i see anointing i see readiness for greater blessings the Lord bless you beyond your expectation in Jesus name let's pray together father we thank you for this hour and for this moment thank you Lord for your people our overseers our pastors our leaders everywhere we're asking Lord that this will be a great time of impartation in Jesus name nobody will escape your blessing bless everyone Lord beyond our expectation and reach every life we well, thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray yeah. we're looking at um, romans chapter 12 and i'm reading from verses 1 and 2 romans chapter 12 
verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You would have noticed that this year the theme of the Congress is steadfastness until Christ's return. That he is from now until the return of Christ for us to be steadfast in the word of God, steadfast in the will of God, steadfast in the service of God, steadfast in blessing other people, ministering to other people, and doing the work he has committed into our hands. That's why we have the first message, steadfast service for the coming king. Because we're talking of the return of Christ. He's coming. And when he comes, he'll find you ready. And we need to offer steadfast service unto the Lord every moment and every day. We should not allow one day to be lost in not offering service to the Lord. And the apostle by the Spirit encourages us, compels us, and he commands us. He says, I beseech you therefore, because of all he has done in our lives, I beseech you therefore, because he has chosen us, because he has called us, because he put us in service, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, the mercy in the plural, mercy in the grace of God in our lives, Mercy because of his love. Mercy because of salvation. Mercy because of that second work of grace, sanctification. Mercy for the power of the Holy Ghost upon our lives. Mercy because he chose us and because he selected us to do his work by the mercies of God. We need to show our gratitude for the mercy he has given us. How do we show the gratitude? The Lord has not left us in the dark wondering oh, what should I do it says that you present your bodies actually we are bought with a price the Lord has brought up, bought, bought us and instead of taking that which he has purchased it says I leave it in your hand that you will come and present your body a living sacrifice there are some people that do not know that as gratitude to the Lord we present everything we have in our body unto the Lord. Some people think their brain is so good, it's good to serve the world, it's good in academics, it's good in various things, but not good. it's too good for the service of God. It says that you present your brain a living continual sacrifice some people think that the skill they have and the opportunities they've got in life is good for their company it's good for things in the world but it's too good for god they think christ they think the church does not need anything of great value if you have uh, something not useful redundant they think you can offer that to the lord but he says no that you present everything you have acquired everything you have learned everything you have experienced you present all your skill all your learning all your ability anything your body can do that you present your bodies a living sacrifice not a dead sacrifice it's a living sacrifice day to day sacrifice holy it's only when it's holy it will be acceptable unto god 
and he says that is your reasonable service what paul the apostle is saying he says there is service that is unreasonable when you give less than what god has provided by his creative power by his mercy by his love when you give less unto god and you give more to the world it says that is unreasonable and it says as you come to him and you present your bodies the totality and the brightness of it and the greatness of it you present it to the lord that is being reasonable and then it says and be not conformed to this world remember he's talking about service and he says in your service to the lord that you will know his perfect will and that you'll have his perfect will you will not be conformed to the world what does that mean you see the people of the world as they serve there are times they have selected service if they're expecting something from the world around them and you can tell what goes on in various places at the time they're expecting those things from those uh, communities and uh, they want to prepare their mind to give what they're expecting they serve and they serve and they serve and they promise and they promise and they promise it says that's the way of the world and after they have got what they're looking for then the service level will drop it says that's the world it says that you will not be conformed to the world only when you are looking for something i'm looking for a blessing i'm asking for healing i'm asking for whatever it is from god and then i serve i serve feverishly it says no make each daily make each deep make each great make each going up growing be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're looking at John chapter 15, reading from verse 13. John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love. As no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. To start with, he calls us friends. We don't merit that. That he has given voluntarily by himself. That Christ the Savior, Christ the Lord of Lords, Christ the King of Kings, should call you friend. What a title what a privilege and then he says you have other friends no doubt you have people around you brothers and sisters no doubt but look at this greater love has no man than this that a man christ and no other should lay down his life for you as his friend he says you've not been a holy friend, a righteous friend, an angelic friend, a perfect friend. You're being an offensive friend. You offended God. And God, to reconcile with you, you have to pay the penalty. Actually, the friendship is having with you, is having to pay your penalty of sin. And it says, there's no greater love than this that christ the holy one the righteous one should lay down his life for you he says now as you compare him with any other friend in your life with any intimate fellow in your life you will see that christ has done for you the unthinkable that he laid down his life for you if you're going to then give any service to anyone this friend who has surrendered his life sacrificed his life 
for you is the one to have the greatest and the brightest and the most wonderful of your service. It says in verse 14, Yeah, my friends, if you do whatsoever, I command you, it will be unthinkable that you will do the commandment of any other human being better than, higher than, greater than the commandments of Christ. It will be unthinkable because of what he has laid down for you. If you will serve any other friend, any other human being more than this Christ who laid down everything for you. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what is Lord doing, but I have called you friends. You are friends of Christ. I said you are friends of Christ. For all things that I have heard of my Father have made known unto you. I come into Psalm 118. Psalm 118, and we're reading from verse 22, 118, reading from verse 22, it says in verse 22, the stone which the builders refused is become the head stone of the corner. It says it's a wonderful thing. This one who says is our friend, is like no other, is at the head of the church, and he is the chief cornerstone. And so as we come to him, there's something then we're going to do. We bring ourselves, we bring our sacrifices. We bring everything we have got to the altar of sacrifice and we give everything we have got unto him. And we're not going to yield, we're not going to turn back. Everything that we have, we give unto him because we're going to be steadfast in the service of the Lord. And I pray you'll be steadfast in Jesus' name. Verse 27. God is the Lord, which has showed us light, the light of salvation. He's shown us the life, the light of his grace. He has shown us and the light of his promise. He has shown us the light of his word. He has shown us what have been in darkness. But he has graciously, mercifully, lovingly showed us light. What are we going to do then? Bind the sacrifice was caught even unto the hands of the altar. We come to serve him. We come to lay everything down. And everything we lay at the altar of the Lord will bind that sacrifice continually, permanently upon the hands of the altar. Steadfast service for the coming king. Three things we're looking at. Number one. The supreme sacrifice of our creator king. He is a creator and he's also our king. And he that should have demanded first sacrifice from us, he has sacrificed his very life for salvation, for redemption. We're going to look at that number one. The supreme sacrifice of our creator king. Number two. The sustained separation from the corrupting kingdoms. A sustained separation from the corrupting kingdoms. We are going to be living in this world. And this world is a kingdom by itself. But it's a defiling kingdom. It's a corrupting kingdom. It's a destructive kingdom, and it's a kingdom that is doomed to perdition all through eternity. And the Lord has so loved us that he called us out, he chose us, and he separated us. And he, wanted, he wants us to maintain and to sustain that separation from the corrupting kingdoms of the world. Number three, 
our selfless surrender. We're not even considering himself anymore. After all, we should have died. After all, we should have perished. But now, he selected us, he chose us, he brought us into life. Because of that, we have a surrender that will not consider self, that will not think of self, a selfless surrender to Christ the King. Our selfless surrender to Christ the King. Number one, we're looking at the supreme sacrifice of a creator king, referring to Christ. Let's see him in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 16. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him were all things created. That's Christ, a redeemer, our king, his creator too. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him. All things were created by him. His king, his redeemer, his savior, his creator. And all things were created for him. We were created for him. He created all things. And he is before all things. Always we need to remember that he is eternal. And he says by him all things consist. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn, the origin, the originator of resurrection, firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So you understand? Christ, Redeemer, Savior, Lord, Healer, He is Creator, King. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, look at verse 2, has in these days spoken unto us by his Son. Now, Christ has so favored us, the one greater than all prophets, all the servants of the Lord in the old covenant. Christ, the higher one, the greater one, the Son of God, that's the one speaking to us by his spirit now. He has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. By whom also he made the worlds. That means the Christ, our king, is creator. By him, Christ. The Almighty God made the worlds, in the plural. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. Though Creator, though King, He made the supreme sacrifice. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor. He's talking about Christ. 
is worthy to receive glory and honor and power look at this for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created when you think of your, the great God the Almighty the one that is mighty and powerful enough to create the whole universe and to create you and then to bring himself down so low as to sacrifice for your salvation you must think about that and give the response that's appropriate for that great supreme sacrifice first corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 in first corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 it says purge out therefore the old leaven anything that is of the old nature the old character the old self-centeredness and the old selfishness and the old leaven that spoils your sacrifice it says purge out therefore have you heard his creator because of that purge all this out have you heard is your king because of that purge this out and have you heard that the highest the greatest the holiest sacrificed himself for you it says because of that Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. Look at this. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Even Christ, head of the church, even Christ, creator of all things, even Christ, the power of God, even Christ the heir of all things is sacrificed for us sacrificed for you sacrificed for me Isaiah chapter 53 the supreme sacrifice of a creator king Isaiah chapter 53 reading from verse 3 he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we did as it were we hid our faces from him the suffering was so great and the sacrifice was so great we hid ourselves from him he was despised we esteemed him not surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He shouldn't normally have taken blame for what we did. But he said, I'll take their blame. I'll take their guilt. I will take their faults. I will take their transgressions. I will suffer for them so that they wouldn't have to suffer. See what he's done for you. That's why the Lord is saying, what are you going to do in response to the sacrifice I made for you? It was wounded for transgressions. It was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes were healed with his stripes were healed all we like sheep have gone astray and he could have left us like that he didn't know the right way when he knew the right way he didn't go the right way they've gone astray if god punishes them they merit their punishment but he will not allow that to happen and because of his love and because of this supreme sacrifice all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him 
the iniquity of us all. He didn't um, sectionalize the blessing, the salvation. That one has gone too far. I cannot save him. That one is a deliberate sinner. I will not save him. That one is a habitual sinner. I will not lay down my life for him. He died for everyone. Thank God he died for you. Thank God he died for me. He didn't say amen for me now. Thank God he died for everyone. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. As you come to Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, the eunuch of Ethiopia was reading that same passage in Isaiah. And it says in chapter 8, reading from verse 30, and Philip ran thither to him and had him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? If we don't understand what we read, what we hear, what we learn about the sacrifice of Jesus, we're not going to make the proper surrender. If we don't understand the depth of his suffering and the height of his agony, if we don't understand what Christ has done, we'll take the sacrifice of Jesus superficially. And if we worship God at all, our worship will not be coming from the depths of our heart. And even though we read about it and we hear about it, if we don't understand, it will be like we're doing God a favor whenever we offer a little thing to the Lord. And Philip asked the man, Understandest thou what thou readest? And the Lord can be asking us the same question today. Understandest thou what thou readest? What you hear? What you learn about the sacrifice of the great creator king? How he suffered for you? How he bore your punishment? So that you will not bear that punishment? So that you will not die? Do you understand what you read? And he said, how can I? How can I understand? How can I appreciate? Except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before a shearer. So opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered, Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this? Of himself, of some other man. Of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself? No. Isaiah could not have given his life for the redemption of the world. No other prophet, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, could have given their lives for the redemption of the world. Of whom speaketh this? Any man in history, any man in any generation, could not have done what Jesus did. Why? They were sinners. They needed redemption themselves. Only Christ, the Son of God, holy, perfect, high as the heavens, had no fault, had no sin of his own. Only himself could have suffered for your sin. And it says, of some other man, look at verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He sacrificed 
He shed his blood so he can purchase our redemption. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God look at this which he purchased with his own blood that's a supreme sacrifice he paid for the life of everyone now in his church and so everyone understanding sacri that sacrifice everyone in the church appreciating that sacrifice everyone part of the church redeemed by that sacrifice should have a proper response and that response is that you will honor the lord with your life sacrifice and reciprocate see what he has done and then give yourself over to him we're looking at hebrews chapter 9 verse 24 hebrews chapter 9 verse 24 for christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands which are the figures of the true but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of god for us to appear in the presence of god for us sinners could not appear in the presence of god by themselves nothing in your hand could you bring that god will look at and say okay you can come in and so christ the holy one christ the great king christ the very son of god christ the spotless sinless flawless one he died for us and now he appears in the presence of god for us now because he's appeared for us and he has reminded the almighty god i paid for his penalty i paid for all the sins he has committed because of that we now can come before the lord because he has put away our sin verse 26 for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself chapter 10 hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 by the which will were sanctified through the offering of the body of jesus christ once for all he did it once and he did it for all people jesus offered himself he paid the great price once and that one sacrifice he paid it for all and every priest and the daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin all the sacrifices of the priests of the people of all religions even the jewish religion could not take away their sin but this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of god is paid for your sin is paid for the sins of the whole world hebrews chapter 13 verse 12 hebrews 13 verse 12 wherefore jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood not with his own teaching with his own blood not with his own good example that was not enough with his own blood 
he suffered without the gate. Look at verse 20. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, walking in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. First Peter chapter 1. Remember, the sacrifice of Christ, supreme, nothing as great, nothing as high, nothing as broad, nothing as wide, nothing as efficacious. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18, for as much as she know that she were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but for the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. That's the sacrifice that Jesus Christ paid. What he did for your redemption, for our redemption. What's the result of that in your life and in my life? Point number two. Our sustained separation from the corrupting kingdom. It says, if you now want to know, how do I serve him? How do I sacrifice? How do I repay a little of what he has done? What am I going to do? There are people that will say they are born again, the children of God, and they sink everything they have into the world. Christ has saved them. Christ has redeemed them. And instead of repaying in a little way to sacrifice and to surrender their lives to the Lord, everything they've got, their brain, their skill, their ability, their knowledge, they sink it into the world to serve the world. But look at what Jesus is saying in John chapter 18. John chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. You want to repay me? You want to reciprocate? You want to give back a little in appreciation of what I've done? What are you going to give back in the kingdom of the world? I'm not there. My kingdom is not there. And my desire is not there. I, I die to save you and bring you out of that world. It says, my kingdom is not of this world. What has he done then? He separates us. And he wants us to understand that separation. We go back, far back to Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20. If you are going to show gratitude to God, do it in his kingdom. If you are going to offer anything in response to what Christ has done, do it in his kingdom. If he has redeemed you, if he has saved you, if he brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of captivity, and you want to say, I'm so grateful for what you've done, show that gratitude not in Egypt, show it in his kingdom. He tells us in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 24. In verse 24, But I have said unto you, Ye shall inherit their land, 
and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. I redeemed you, I separated you. I redeemed you, I set you apart. I redeemed you, I brought you out of the kingdom of darkness. Now, if you're going to show gratitude unto me, because I redeemed you, you cannot go and show that gratitude in the kingdom from which I took you, I separated you. Look at verse 26. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I am the, I the Lord am holy, and I have severed you. I have severed you. I have separated you from other people that ye shall be mine. It says everything you sacrificed on them in the world, I'm asking, when are you going to turn around? When are you going to sacrifice to me? When are you going to separate yourself fully unto me? I have severed you, I've separated you. Exodus chapter 33. In Exodus chapter 33, reading from verse 16, sometimes somebody has made it as they say in the world it's got money it's got acceptance appreciation awards good jobs and people say that's good that's what they all say they are that kingdom if that person now will give his life to the Lord and give his skill to the Lord and give his ability to the Lord, they say, what's happening to you? Why are you giving your talent, your skill, your ability? Why are you giving that to church? That's what they understand. And they say, they have enough people to serve them. Those who cannot make it in life, they cannot make it in trade. They cannot make it in education. They cannot make it in business. Leave them to go and be preaching. It's those who are, you know, so poor and so down. They don't have any talent. They don't have any skill. Let them go and be serving God in the church. But you, a person like you, of all people, they're saying that only the worst is good enough for Christ was sacrificed so great and so high but look at exodus chapter 33 reading here from verse 16 for wherein shall it be known here that i and thy people have found grace in thy sight is it not in that thou goest with us so shall we be separated so shall we be separated i and thy people the leader and the followers the pastors and the whole church the shepherd and the sheep the same consecration the same appreciation is expected by the lord somebody is young and the lord has made a supreme sacrifice for him another person is old and the lord has made a supreme sacrifice for him the lord is expecting that both the young and the old will show appreciation for what god has done and actually he has separated everyone i and thy people from all the people that on the face of the earth on the face of the earth you look at what the people on the face of the earth what they're doing for the kingdoms of this world and how they make their research and how they you know they, they make progress almost in every line and they say they're going to contribute something to the world before they leave this world and those of us in the kingdom that he has separated from the world, why don't we then dig deep and make some research? What can I offer more? How can I make the work of God to go on better than it had ever been? 
Some people have come before me into the service of God. They have come before me to the kingdom of God. Thank God for what they have done. I am come now into the kingdom. That's what you shall say. What can I contribute to the kingdom of God in appreciation for what God has done for me beyond and above those who have come in before me? He wants us to be separated from the world and then to give the best of what we have in the service of the Lord. We're coming to Micah chapter 2. Micah chapter 2 from verse 10. Micah chapter 2 from verse 10. Arise ye and depart. The Lord speaking to his own people, speaking to us. Arise ye and depart. It's like we are lingering in the world. We are lingering in the kingdoms of the world. We are still strategizing. We are still thinking. This community or this world in which I am. What am I going to do? And God said, arise ye and depart. You are contributing too much of your life. To the kingdoms of the world that will perish. You are contributing too much of your life to the kingdoms of the world that offered nothing to you. Arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. I came to save you. I came to give everything for you. So you can have rest, so you can have peace, and so you can have the calmness that is not in the world. There are storms in the world. There are confusions in the world. There's commotion in the world. And it's like the more you do and the more you contribute to that world, the more corrupt it is still. Because it's a corrupted world and it's a corrupting kingdom. And if you could sink everything you've got into that world, the world is still going to be the same. But God has raised up a new kingdom. The kingdom of his dear son. And he has saved you. He has separated you from the kingdom of the world. Arise ye and depart. For this is not your rest. Because it is polluted. Kingdoms of the world. It is polluted. It shall destroy you. It shall destroy you, even with a sore destruction. It says, that's why I came to save you. And you need not to appreciate the saving of the Lord, separating you out of those things that will destroy you, defile you, corrupt you, condemn you, damn your soul. John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, verse 14. John 17, verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. That's what Jesus is saying. He said, I made the supreme sacrifice so that I'll take you out of that evil world, out of that destructive world, out of that corrupting world. And he says, you're not of the world even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, cleanse them, purge them, purify them, set them apart for your glory. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 14. 
2 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 14. In verse 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Unbelievers might call you. Now you're a believer. Let's covenant together to improve the world. Let's covenant together to rule this world. Let's covenant together so that we can do something. We can sacrifice everything we've got to the world. Bring everything you've got. I bring everything I've got and we unite together for the kingdoms of this world. The word of God says no. You have a better assignment than that. A greater assignment than that. Be not unequally yoked together with some believers. They might bring their plan. They might bring all their proposals. And it might look good. It's good for them. They are of the world. And you are of Christ. And it says you will not be unequally yoked together with those unbelievers. They cannot do anything in the kingdom here, in the kingdom of God. You cannot be unequally yoked together with them to come and build the kingdom of Christ. Neither can you be unequally yoked with them to build the kingdoms of the world. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? What concord has Christ with Belial? Look up here for a moment. You're a Christian, you're a child of God. And you have the ability. You have the skill. You have the learning, for example, to build. Build what I mean build. Build a good sanctuary. And then somebody, an idol worshiper, has knowledge about you. That where you build is a state of the art. And so he comes to you and he says, I've heard about you. I'm planning to build a shrine. It's another idol worshiper. But he says, all the shrines I see around, they aren't good enough. I want to build something magnificent for Satan. Therefore, help me. I'll pay you your money. I'll pay you whatever you want for me to pay you. I just want something classic as a shrine. So that it's not only my local community people that can worship there. When people come from overseas, it will become a tourist attraction. And you are going to get the money for it. As a Christian, will you do it? I can't hear our people. No, you cannot do it. The skill is there. The skill is not to build for the shrines of the world. You know, some people, they listen to, you know, our music, and they say, this is good. And somebody is coming from, you know, the nightclub, and he's saying, you know, it comes to some of these uh, people, and he said, you know what? Come and teach us music in our place. Because, you know, the people, the tunes and the tones and everything is old. And people are not coming to the nightclubs that they ought to come anymore. We need your help. As a Christian musician, can you go and help them in the nightclub? I'm waiting for your answer. No. There's a congregation teaching false doctrine. And they don't accept that Jesus is the Christ. The only Christ and the only Savior. And they now want you to help them. They're still going to preach their false doctrine. They're still going to do whatever they're doing. That is not honoring the Lord. That is not recognizing the sacrifice of Christ. But they have seen that, you know, the young people, youths love music. And they pick you out. 
They say you can keep on going to your church deeper life, but come and help us at your free time so that when you teach our people and they have good, good music, then the work and the doctrine, the first doctrine we're preaching will take root in the lives of young people. People will come for the sake of the music and then they would also listen to what we're preaching. As a Christian musician, can you do that? I'm waiting for a good answer. No, you cannot do that. That is like helping false doctrine to prosper. It's helping false religion to prosper. That's what he's saying. He's saying you separate yourself. If you have any skill, if you have any ability, if you have any talent, he says, I saved you. I separated you. I brought you in so that you can give everything you've got for the progress of the kingdom of Christ. Look at verse 15. What concord as Christ with Belial? Or watch patch as he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement as the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, what does it say? I said, what does it say? Okay, what does it tell you? Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. And be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The mouth that sings for the Lord will not sing for Satan. The mouth that witnesses and preaches the gospel, the gospel of grace, will not turn around and speak for Satan. And the lie that is useful for the kingdom of God, separated unto him, will not turn around and go and serve the devil. Amen in your life. Amen in our church. Yeah. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 13. Who has delivered us? You are delivered. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now that we are translated into the kingdom of his dear son, what do we do? Point number three, our selfless surrender to Christ the King. Our selfless surrender to Christ the King. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because with us judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. If one died for all, then were all dead. What does that mean? We should have died. But Christ came and died for us. And now, because he died for us, we identify with him. We have died already. And think about it. If you had died without Christ, without hope, without salvation, you will not be saying, I will build, I will act, I will progress, I will succeed, I will study, I'll get another doctorate certificate, I'll get another of this, I'll get another that. 
you are dead. So count yourself dead. He died for you. So that now as you know that you are dead, the rest of your life is to be sacrificed for the Lord. Say amen. amen. Verse 15. That, and that he died for all. That they, look at this, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Should not be seen my career, my goal, my vision, my aspiration, my ambition, my family, my car, my everything. We're not living to ourselves anymore. It says that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again died for them and rose again we're coming to psalm 4 reading from verse 3 psalm 4 we're reading from verse 3 he has saved us so that we can fully or reservedly surrender unto him psalm 4 verse 3 but know that the lord has set apart him that is godly for himself the lord has set apart him that is godly for himself i want you to look up here it's like the whole world is lining up it's like the whole nation is lining up it's like your whole stage is lining up it's like your whole community is lining up and God is going through that queue. He comes to you, he pulls you apart, sets you apart. He comes to that saved soul, brings him apart. Brings, comes to that sister, brings her apart. And then as he sets all those people that were for him. He sets them apart. He looks at you. He says, look at all those people still on the queue. They are not saved. I've not picked them. I've not set them apart. But you are redeemed. You are a child of God now. I set you apart for myself. That means then you cannot do what the others are doing. Your ambition is different. Because he set you apart, he has something for you to do. What he has for you to do, you will do it. You will do it well. The Lord will reward you here on earth and in heaven in Jesus' name. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself not for the kingdoms of the world for himself not for satan for himself not to improve on things that the antichrist is going to rule over he set you apart for himself the lord will hear when i call on him he will answer your prayer isaiah chapter 43 Isaiah chapter 43, verse 21. These people have I formed for myself. I'm sure you have um, heard of a company that recruited people. When they recruit the people, at the time of uh, being recruited, they knew nothing. They were not skilled people. But after they were recruited, they were sent for training. So that when they come back for the training, that company will be able to make use of them. And they spent so much on them. So that when they come back, they will serve that company. The expectation is, as they come back from the training, their time, their skill, the learning, everything they've got from that training, 
they'll use it for the company that sent them and trained them. That's what God is talking about here. These people, those who are saved, these people, those who are redeemed, these people, those who are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, these people, the people that Christ himself has saved. He says, these people have I formed, transformed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. He will show forth the praise of the Lord. He's redeemed us for himself. We're looking at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Here in verse 14, it says, Who gave himself for us. He made no reservation. That is, he didn't say, This is too good for their redemption. I'm reserving this one. This is too beautiful, too precious for me to give up for their redemption. I'm keeping this for myself. But he gave himself without reservation for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Look at this now. And purify, tell me. Purify, tell me. Unto himself. Unto himself. You see what Christ has done? He needs servants. He needs preachers. He needs prayer warriors. He needs singers. He needs talented people. He needs scientifically minded people. He needs people that can work with modern day equipment and get his message out to the world. And so he purifies unto himself. If you then have been purified, you have been saved, you have been set apart, you have been separated, you have been sanctified, and then you don't understand that he purified you and trained you for himself. And then you rush into the world, you're looking for, you know, money, you're looking for this and that. He purified you unto himself. You know, sometimes there are people, they think the church should be so perfect that when they come to work there, everything will go on smoothly. And then they come, they see there's something to adjust there. There's something to improve there. There's something to add to there. There is something that needs skillful hand there. Oh, they say, I don't know it's like this, that, you know, the church still needs this attention, that attention. I cannot uh, walk in that uh, situation. I'm going to give my talent to the world. That's why you came. If it's not all right, set it right. If it's not beautiful enough, make it beautiful. If it's not orderly enough, make it orderly. That's why you are there. You don't know whether you are in the kingdom for such a time as this. If your fellow brother does not have the skill, he cannot do it. You can do it, get up and do it. If you know that that preacher cannot, you know, do everything and you have the ability, get up and do it. The Lord will use you. I said the Lord will use you. He has purified you unto himself, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord. Nobody will take your service away from you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Wherefore? We receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. This Congress is going to be a Congress of transformation, a Congress of receiving more grace from God, a Congress of dedication to the Lord. And whatever you have offered to the Lord in the past, praise the Lord, you will not lose your reward. 
but a new day of service has come a new year of service has come as we come to as we get to the new year after the watch night service tonight and then we move to the new year new strength in jesus name new love in jesus name greater grace upon your life in jesus name your service will help your neighbor your service will bring more souls into the kingdom your service will make the church to grow for go forward and grow higher in jesus name every little thing you do faithfully the lord will use it to make his what make progress in this land in this country in this continent and beyond in jesus name wherefore now we receive in a kingdom that cannot be moved you'll be in that heavenly kingdom tonight let us have grace whereby you and i may serve god acceptably with reverence and godly fear grace is available tonight the strength of the lord is available tonight let's rise up now and seek the face of the lord more grace more strength more ability more enablement it will help you he will help you he must help you he has set you apart for himself set you apart for himself to render greater higher service unto the lord he will not fail you you will not disappoint god